beach hundreds of times before and discovered numerous interesting and useful items. But this was his first body. A youngish woman, not unattractive and on closer inspection, thankfully, not dead. It took him over an hour to get her back to his shack, or the Ritz, as he had christened it. It wasn't that she was particularly heavy, but she was just a dead weight, so he had to construct a sort of stretcher from bits and pieces of wood on the beach, tied together with some blue nylon rope that he had picked up a couple of days before, with his anorak stretched across it. He managed to roll her onto it, and then drag it the half mile or so back to his shelter. This is when you really need your mobile phone, he thought to himself. And he hadn't had that thought for however long it was that he'd been there. Six months, maybe? He wasn't sure. Inside, he checked her pulse, which she still seemed to have, and her breathing was regular-ish. So once he had heaved her onto his bed, he left her to come round in her own time. Once she was conscious again, he would think about what to do next. He had been reading for a while when he looked across at her. How long have you been staring at me? He asked in a tone that suggested amusement more than anything else. She blinked, looking around her unexpected landing place. What's your name? she asked in reply. I picked you up off the beach earlier this morning. No response. Did you have some sort of accident? Still nothing. Is there someone I should get in touch with? I can walk to the village. It's about an hour away. How long did you say I've been here? She asked. Couple of hours, maybe. Something like that. Sorry, what did you say your name was? I didn't. I don't have one anymore. What? Someone stole it. No? There was a pause. I suppose... I should say thank you, she offered half-heartedly. It depends whether you're grateful or not. That's very astute of you. They are off to an interesting start. If you haven't got a name, what am I supposed to call you? Tell you what, he said. I'll call you Flotsam, so I'll call you Jetsam, right? She was quick. Right, he agreed. In time, the names got shortened to Floss and Jet, but the idea was still the same. That first day consisted mostly of not asking obvious questions, waiting to see if any explanations were offered. They weren't. Later on, she did ask, Is it okay if I stay here for a bit? when it was clearly already too late to go anywhere that evening. Sure, he said, and left it at that, not really knowing exactly what she meant by a bit. When it got dark, he asked her, Fancy something to eat? Thanks, but I'm not really hungry, she said. But when she saw him opening tins and boiling up pasta, she changed her mind. Everything's either tinned or dried, he said. I've got provisions for probably six months. It was a year, but <laughs> I've eaten half of it. Is this all you eat? she said. What about fresh stuff, fruit and veg and water? I sometimes go to the village for vegetables and fruit, and there's a stream that runs down to the sea just behind the shack. It's 
probably why the shack was built here. So it's your shack then? she asked. Tis now, he said. They sat in silence and ate tagliatelle with chopped tomatoes and mixed chilli beans, followed by instant coffee from a huge catering-sized tin with powdered milk. Uh, Michelin stars? he inquired. <laughs> that would be nice, she replied. There were two rooms to the shack, living room and bedroom nominally. You can have the bed tonight, he offered, feeling thoroughly gallant. What about you? I'll be fine here, he said. When he woke up, he was back at school, in the sixth form, at the Christmas disco. The Christmas disco, to be more accurate. And Anna was there, in the corner with her friends. He'd have fancied her forever, but there always seemed to be another bloke in the picture somehow. But there she was tonight, just with girlfriends. It was his chance if he had the bottle. Then they're outside, in the school car park. She seemed as keen as he was, if he was reading the messages which he was. Suddenly, the letter came into focus. The one she'd written to him when he was at uni. Sorry and all that. It had been great. He was a lovely person. And then the all-time cheesiest phrase, let's remember the good times. Let's not, he thought. And now he had Mariana on his knee, laughing and gurgling. And Anna was out in the kitchen doing something. And then suddenly, back at the disco again, and he couldn't work out why. And he wanted it to stop. And then it did. Why? Suddenly called Flotsam. That wasn't her name. Her parents called her Marigold, but she always told people it was Marie, Marie Baptiste. Marigold. Just too embarrassing. Parents, Kingston and Dimple Baptiste. Children, boys, Maceo, Bijou and Farouk. Girls, Carmen. And very good. Where did that name come from? Not enough that you got different skin. You got to have a different name too. In the street, it's okay. We're all the same, more or less, you know. In school, you're never the same. College, never the same. Work, never the same. Now, I got new skin, white skin, smooth blonde hair. Now, cold. Lots of. The light woke him up. He felt stiff, really stiff. He was sprawled out on the floor in a pile of clothes and stuff for some reason. Then he remembered why. He tried to focus, but too much was going through his head, not much of it making any sense. So he made a decision to go for a swim. When she peeped through the makeshift door, the place was empty. Had he gone? Where to? When was he coming back? Would he be coming back? She thought about leaving before he did, but to go where and why? She went outside and sat on the bench, which was made from two oil drums and a bit of rough planking, and she tried not to think, not to think about what had happened, not to think about what might happen next. She sat there for a while, but he didn't come back, so she went inside again. When he returned from his swim, maybe an hour or so later, neither of them really knew how to play it. So instead of talking, they didn't. He made some sort of porridge, which he ate with enthusiasm, and she, out of politeness. Then she suddenly said she was going for a walk. Uh, planning to come back? 
he asked. She looked at him, trying to gauge the meaning behind the question. In the end, she said, If that's okay with you, Jetsam. He laughed and she smiled. Not much was any clearer by the time she got back. Plan A had failed and she really didn't have a plan B. So play it by ear, she thought. He was thinking very much the same sort of thing, but maybe for different reasons. The one thing he was excellent at by now, having had plenty of practice, was not talking. And that seemed to suit them both pretty well for the time being. Luckily, it was fairly good weather for March, so they spent most of their time outside, which was good since inside was not exactly salubrious. At one time, it had been a nice enough beach hut, not designed for living in, but solid and comfortable. When it had been abandoned, most of the furniture and fittings had just been left, as though someone had definitely intended to return, but changed their mind for whatever reason and left it, Marie Celeste-like, with a copy of The Guardian still on the table, giving a precise date of departure. Of course, there was no electricity or running water, but there were candles and a stream, a colour gas heater and a little camping stove that he had acquired. So that covered most bases. It was survival camp. And so the days passed, quietly and largely uneventfully. She did a bit of the cooking, if you can call it that, and she was tempted to tidy the place up a bit, but thought better of it. At first they only spoke when necessary, and that was comfortable for them. Then they spoke occasionally, about politics and society and philosophy, heady stuff. They never spoke about themselves, and the days seemed to turn into weeks, though neither of them was counting. But the nights, the nights were different. When he woke up, he was in the water. And he knew he couldn't swim. He was shouting out for help. But Anna was on the boat and she was waving to him and laughing. And then Anna was holding Mariana over the edge of the boat. And the little girl was waving her arms and kicking her little legs. And they were both laughing. Then he was on the beach shouting something. Then he was back in the boat. But Anna and Mariana weren't there. Where were they? He could smell the bacon and burnt toast. It was it Sunday breakfast? And slowly, the water closed over his head. We are all sitting round the table. Aki and codfish as usual on Sunday. Red striped beer for Dad and the boys coconut milk for us. Boys arguing with Dad, same as ever. Always in trouble somehow. Get a proper job, he says. You're not boys now. Don't expect me to support you forever. Carmen saying she wants to leave school. Get a job at a hairdresser's. I got a letter, I say. What letter, says Ma. Offer letter, I say. Offer to go to university. Long silence. Why do you want to go there, says Dad? Waste of time. I'm in the big dining hall. I'm sat at a table, just me. I'm wearing my new clothes, on my own. All white faces looking at me, whispering, whispering. What's she doing here? English literature. What do you want to be here for, girl? I'm saying to myself, I'm in my room, I'm in the library, I'm in the lecture hall on my own. Congratulations, Miss Baptiste. You can keep your degree, I say. What good will it do me? What good? What good? What good? It 
It's maybe two months, something like that, who knows? Only the food stores are keeping count. Now they're easy with each other in a different way. Close, but not intimate, if that makes sense. They start to talk a bit more openly, little bits at a time, where she's from, where he's from, his job before, her job before, that sort of thing, tit for tat. Never the reason for being there, not even close. But the troubled nights, they continue. Her in his bed, him on a newly constructed put-you-up. They walk a lot together, along the beach, but not towards the village. Sometimes they walk separately, and that makes walking together better. He's got quite a lot of books in the shack. It turns out that he did English literature at university too. So they discuss Salman Rushdie and George Eliot, and mostly disagree. They go into the village occasionally. She needs to get some clothes and there's a charity shop. Jet gives her the money, but not much. He doesn't have much of the 500 pounds he brought with him. That would run out eventually anyway. They try fishing without much success. Well, without any success, really. So it's back to tinned tuna and sardines. Life in the slow lane, he would have called it once. That's when lanes meant something to him. Now, Anna's face appeared to him more and more frequently, sometimes laughing, sometimes questioning, sometimes blank and blue. Sometimes her face turned into Mariana's face, but he couldn't reach her. That was the worst thing, not being able to reach them. The girls in the office were whispering, whispering again, only it wasn't really whispering. She was meant to hear. She was the researcher. She was meant to be in charge of them. Why does she wear those clothes? Fuzzy hair, strange smell. How has she got this job? It's raging inside her now, like a fire that's been lit and it won't go out. She's grabbed the taller one, Penny, by the collar of her blouse. She's shoving her against the cupboard door. She wants to choke her, to shut her up. Now, she's outside the building. She can't go in again. She's sitting on the pavement, crying. And people pass by, but they don't say anything. He seems to be drifting in and out of consciousness. Anna's face appears, then Flo's face. She's wiping his face with a cool cloth. Now he's under the water again, and he's struggling to get to the surface, but he never reaches it. He's lying on his own bed in the shack, just for a moment, then everything disappears again. Penny's dead. She must be. Everyone is screaming at her. Her dad is screaming at her. Her mum is crying. Mr. Lloyd, her boss, is handing her an envelope. He's shaking his head. Now her mouth is full of codfish. So full, it's choking her. And her father is pushing more fish in. And he's laughing now. And she's choking. And there's Jet's face over her. As she lies on the floor, on the bed, and he isn't laughing or shouting, she drifts away. He's holding Mariana in his arms, 
trying to wake her up, but she won't. And Anna is beside him, but she can't help because she's dead, completely dead. So he sinks below the surface, slowly, calmly, and they come with him. But she can't remember how she got onto the beach, how she got onto the stretcher. He thinks she's dead. Maybe she is. If she is, that's okay. It's okay. We're okay. It's dark when he opens his eyes, so he can't see her, but he knows she's there, there beside him on the bed. He doesn't know how he got there. It doesn't matter anyway, because she's there beside him. He can hear her, sense her, knows she's there. Are you awake? She says, out of the darkness, and he's not sure whether the voice is real, but he thinks it is. Yes, he says, and waits for her to say something else. You were in a bad place, she says. I helped you onto the bed. That's all I remember. How long ago was that? He's confused because... He doesn't even know why he's confused. The shack was shaking and rolling around. I thought it must be a storm or something. So I got you onto the bed, but then I don't remember what happened. She was silent for a while. Then I woke up. A few minutes ago, I think. The bed is a wreck. Pillows on the floor. Sheets draped off the side and end. And an atmosphere in the room like... Like after... Armageddon. They lie side by side, unseen, unseeing and silent. My name's Dale, he says suddenly. She hesitates at first, then says, Mine's Marie, I mean, Marigold. They both smile blindly. Then he feels across the bed and finds her elbow, then her hand. She links her fingers between his, and they wait quietly for sleep, which slowly, gently engulfs them. They have each decided where the next step might take them. A sort of plan, at least. Music